welcome to Anesthesia Coffee Break. I'm Lahiri. And yes, this podcast is all about tips and tricks and knowledge about getting through your primary exam. Um, but also we really want to focus on you know, how to get through this exam while still maintaining your health. And so this special episode is about mums trying to get through the primary exam and what their experience is. And so again, a really massive thanks to Kaylee Jordan. So Dr. Kaylee, she's a staff specialist and she's going to be chairing the session. She's a staff specialist at Ro- Royal Melbourne Hospital. And she she is perfectly placed to talk about the exam and uh, this probably your mum's anesthesia, but she's both a uh, Renton Prize winner as well as a Merit Prize for the final exam winner. And she's a mum. And she has a special interest in education and she's helped so many people in, with their primary and final exams and works extensively with the AS and a lot of the work that they do in education, and especially the primary and SIMG preparations. And, you know, until recently, she loved marathon running, uh, camping, spending time with family on King Island and mainland Tasmania, and going on adventures on the boat she lived on for seven years. I just, I definitely have to delve into that a bit more. <laughs> um, now she has a 23-month-old and a 10-week-old at, at home these days, and these activities are temporary on hold uh, for that. But I'm hoping they'll be back again, I'm sure, Kaylee. So, um, that's Kaylee. We'll get to her very soon. And I'm going to uh, put it over to Stan, my amazing co convener of this. And Stan, tell us a bit about this session. Oh, thank you so much, Lara. It's a team effort. Um, look, I just want to quickly say just how incredibly proud and honored I am to have Steph, Ari, and Julia come on today to share their stories, uh, as well as Kaylee to share this session. All, of, all four of you are role models. And I truly believe your inspirational journeys you know, we'll lay the foundations upon which, you know, the success of all our future trainees will be built upon, especially for all the mums out there who will be listening to this uh, podcast. And, you know, I think these stories, they're going to be a source of motivation. I think that uh, a lot of times this exam is an exam of stamina. And I think that when we hear these incredible inspirational stories, it just helps motivate us. And, you know, I just want to say thank you so much. So now I'd like to hand it over to Kaylee to start sharing the session. Thanks very much, Dan, and thanks, Lahiri, for that introduction. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Kaylee. I'm an anaesthetist at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, as Lahiri said, uh, and also a mum of a 23 month old girl called Holly and a nine week old boy called Flynn. Uh, I had my children after finishing my training, so I've never known what it's like to try to juggle parenting, working, and studying at the same time. Um, However, having found both parenting and studying for the exams very challenging individually, I have enormous respect and admiration for those that do both of these at the same time. Um, A good friend of mine actually sat the primary exam at the same time I did with an almost two-year-old boy. And after this, she had a baby girl and sat the final exam with an 18-month-old and a four-year-old. I'd ring her up in a mad panic in the middle of an uninterrupted 10-hour-long study session three weeks out from the exam and she'd be at a birthday party or cooking cupcakes with her children. Uh, I think what really stood out in the difference between how we studied was that my study was filled with social media checks, making a million cups of tea I'd never finished and generally procrastinating or reading around topics very slowly, uh, whereas her approach was much more direct and purposeful. So during the time that she was studying, it was dedicated, intense study time. So she would study smarter rather than longer. At the time, I remember her reflecting on the enormous mum guilt that she constantly felt during this time. Uh, She said whenever she would be studying, she'd feel guilty that she wasn't spending time with her kids. Whenever she was spending time with her kids, she'd feel guilty that she wasn't studying. Uh, As I said, I never sat my exams as a mum, but I've had many moments where I've felt that I'm putting my career in front of my family life. Uh, Whenever I feel this guilt, I remind myself of something that my daughter's nanny always tells me. She says that we're being role models, teaching our children that you can have both a great family life and a great career. Um, I'm going to actually quote Michelle Obama, who said, for me, being a mother made me a better professional because coming home every night to my girls reminded me what I was working for. And being a professional made me a better mother because by pursuing my dreams, I was modeling for my girls how to pursue their dreams. I thought that was quite a nice quote. (laughs) Uh, So today we're going to hear from three mums and anaesthetic registrars who are showing their children how to pursue their dreams. Steph Mulligan, Ariane Tioc and Julia Inman have all successfully passed the most recent sitting of the primary exams while parenting seven young children between them. 
They have each had challenges along the way, but have ultimately been successful in completing this enormous professional hurdle. I'll be asking each of them some questions about their exam journeys, with the hope that other medical parents listening may benefit from the lessons they learned along the way. So if you have any questions for them, please just save them until the Q&A at the end of this webinar. So we'll start with you, Steph. Steph is a BTY2 anaesthetic registrar and mother of two-year-old Margot, four-year-old Eddie and six-year-old Henry and a seven-year-old Whippet Charlie. <laughs> she refers to herself and her cardiology fellow husband as muggles with no other doctors in either of their families. Her passion for anaesthesia was ignited as an undergraduate pharmacist on placement where she met an anaesthetic registrar and was inspired by the way that she directly applied her knowledge of physiology and pharmacology to patient care and she's pursuing, been pursuing this career since. She spent her junior doctor years in Melbourne before moving to Queensland for anaesthetic training to be closer to family. Despite this, she reserves the use of her family for childcare emergencies only and relies on a combination of school, after-school care, childcare, a private nanny, and synchronised shifts with her husband in order to balance work and childcare. And if that wasn't enough to juggle, she also successfully passed the primary exam in the most recent sitting after a previous attempt earlier this year. Um, has supported her husband through successfully passing his cardiology exams and has done all of this while somehow finding the time to read a fiction book every one to two weeks throughout the study process. I feel exhausted just saying all of that aloud. <laughs> um, we'll start with some questions for you, Steph. No worries. You had, you had your youngest child, Margot, while on the anaesthetic training program, but prior to sitting your primary exam. What specific challenges did this present and what advice would you give to others that may be considering doing the same? So obviously this presents a lot of challenges, um, but for us, um, the, we always felt like fertility couldn't wait and anything that happened with medicine could. And I knew from a young age that being a mum was really important to me and I was always happy to put that first, which I think is quite um, uh, not a lot of people would probably say that, but that was definitely my um, thoughts going into it. And I think um, I went to postgraduate medical school. So I was an intern when I was 27. I got onto the anesthesia training program when I was 30. Um, so I didn't actually start the training program until I was 31. And I was always quite conscious. Um, we knew that fertility would be an issue for us. So we just wanted to um, basically, I think when you know that and you go to medical school, you know that as soon as you're halfway through your internship, you need to think about start having children. Um, and so that was the most important thing for us. Um, I think then with regards to um, uh, sitting the exam, I also knew that I wouldn't be able to um, sit the exam pregnant because I got terrible morning sickness. So I had to sort of time it around um, the kids. And I think if you sort of look at my um, career trajectory, the way everything worked out was all basically timed around um, the kids um, uh, some of the other challenges I think have been um, trying to negotiate maternity leave while working on um, short-term contracts where you keep changing hospital um, and then trying to negotiate um, interrupted training and part-time training uh, within the, the rules of the college and both the, the hospital and health service that employs you. It sounds like there's uh, a lot of a lot of challenges there and a lot that would relate to a lot of people listening today especially with postgraduate medicine becoming more and more common exactly. um, yeah there's uh, I think a lot of people that are that are making similar decisions and choices that you have there what advice would you give to these people that were considering doing what you've done uh, in terms of timing of their um, family planning I suppose you just um, oh, it's really really hard I, I always felt like I, I wanted to do anesthetics um, if, you know before or I even went to medical school. So I had this sort of really clear idea of what I wanted to do, but I also knew that that absolutely was not a given and it could take me, you know, two years to get on. It could take five years to get on. So I always felt like um, the most important thing to do was to just have our family when it suited us and then just try to force medicine to work around that, which has obviously been really, really hard. But I think um, kind of coming out the other side of the, the primary, it's like, well, you know, I've gotten onto the program, I've got one set of exams out of the way and we've actually, we've, we've had our family. So even though we now both have a lot of grey hair, um, we've kind of got these two, you know, big things behind us. Mm. Uh, 
it sounded like it was all a, a gamble that paid off well for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you definitely do, I think, need to have a, um, like a lot of determination and just uh, really kind of keep that focus in mind because, you know, I've lost count of the number of people who told me I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, and you just have to really, really put that aside. When I, when I was a um, anaesthetic resident, so when I, I came back from maternity leave with my first child and I was a resident, my midterm feedback was that I'd been too emotionally affected by the birth of my child to consider a career in anaesthesia and I should wow. be without GP or paediatrics. And um, I think, you know, I really took that comment and was like, I'm going to prove this person wrong and I have to think about it all the time and get angry and, you know, yeah. really... You use that anger in a positive way. It sounds like it motivated you well and yeah, absolutely. You, you, you proved them wrong, so good on you. Um, you're, you and your husband were able to negotiate a fixed roster with your hospitals, meaning that you could each have a set weekday off for your, to care for your children. Did you have any difficulties in negotiating this? And what advice would you give to others wishing to, to make a similar arrangement? Um, absolutely. It was really difficult. And both hospitals basically straight up said no when we first asked. Um, we were both lucky in that we have both been at the same hospital for two years in a row. So I think that gave us some... Um, we knew the people we had to negotiate with straight away. And um, my advice would be to just start early. So as soon as you get a job, start looking at that. So that's sort of like in September planning for the year, um, February uh, and onwards. Um, and then trying to present um, solutions to the hospital. So for instance, for me, um, I just took, um, I work in a hospital that has kind of 12 different roster lines. And, um, uh, one of the ones to cover was the um, evening shifts on the birth suite, which, which was a Monday to Thursday. So I said, well, can I have a Friday off? And then I can work um, Monday to Thursday, day, evening or night shift. It doesn't matter. Plus on the weekend. But I just, if I can have that Friday off, then that's a day that I don't need to organise childcare on. Um, so just trying to, I think, present a solution to the hospital might help. With my husband, um, he was getting paid heaps and heaps of un, um, unrostered overtime. So he suggested, could he switch from a um, eight to four physician type schedule to more of a um, eight to six, like anesthetic type schedule? And could he and the two other fellows do that, which would save the hospital money and give them all a day off during the week? So uh, that, you know, took a lot of time to negotiate and there was a lot of pushback, but eventually it was agreed to. So amazing work. Well done. Uh, it, it's widely said that a thousand hours of study is needed to pass the primary exam. Uh, although you and your husband covering each other's shifts, as you put it, would have helped with the childcare challenges that would be universal with two medical rosters, I imagine it would make finding solo time to study difficult. When and how did you find the time required to study for the exam? And did your approach to this change between your first and second sitting? Yeah, um, so I first of all gave myself a really long lead time, which was probably not actually enough, but I started studying about 14 months before my first attempt when my youngest child, when I was on maternity leave with my youngest child, she was five months old. I um, basically every day would get up before five and do an hour from five till six when all the kids were asleep. And I pretty much stuck to that um, the entire way through. That was kind of a non-negotiable for me and I'm better at studying in the morning. Um, and I would do less at night or easier things at night. Um, I think um, the biggest thing was working part-time. I just could not have done it working full-time and I would use um, a day of childcare or school. Um, the kids would be out of the house at seven so I could get started and then I would work through to that too, um, take, taking breaks, of course, and then I would go um, leave the house, go to the library and then our nanny would pick up the kids and sort of do the evening and I could just come home at six so I could get a really massive study day um, during the week when the kids were all out of the house. Something that we learned between the two sittings was that I initially picked up um, pretty much all of the slack with regards to sick leave so that was something that was really challenging for us whenever the kids were sick I would just look after them because it always felt wrong to make um, my husband stay home and look after the kids when I was at home studying. And that was probably just, you know, meant that I was consistently under target because there's obviously a huge amount of sick leave when you've got three young children in childcare. Mm. Um, 
So the second time around, we had to just switch that. And I had to say to my husband, you have to do all of the sick leave cover, like no matter what, your colleagues will hate you, but this is the only way we're going to get the exam done. Yeah. Um, so I think that's something that really helped um, as well. Yeah, just to have that protected time. Yeah. So speaking of that, then what particular positives and negatives do you think does come from having a medical partner? Um, and how did that uh, that affect the way in which you approach your exam preparation? Um, I think a lot of positives are that you really understand each other's experience. Um, I mean, Andrew knew how hard medical exams were, and I'll maintain that our anaesthetic exams are way harder than the physician's <laughs> exams. Um, <laughs> we always uh, joke about that. Um, so I think I think that was good. Um, he could, ex you know, he can explain things to me. I'm terrible at reading ECGs, um, but <laughs> it's it's useful to have him, um, you know, to teach me things and. I think just understand the like a sheer volume of dedication that, you know, your friends can't understand, even like our families just couldn't understand, you know, how just how much work was required for the exam. Um, I think things that, that are that are really hard is obviously um, him working shift work as well and weekends. Um, it, it being so hard in medicine to ever take time off, you know, you can't work from home. That's really challenging. And then just having the, the long days that we do have in medicine, which um, is where our nanny really came in um, to pick the kids up so they didn't have to have a massive day as well. Mm. So, yeah. A, a good nanny is worth their weight in gold. <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> um, what, finally, what lessons did you learn during your primary exam journey that you think people listening could benefit from that we haven't already discussed? Um, yeah, this is something I learned quite late, but um, reflecting on it, I think everything with kids takes longer, whether that's like trying to do housework or trying to sit the primary exam. I think I always went into it thinking, okay, I've got to do this year of study. I've got to fit this year in with the kids. Like I can't, you know, I can't be trying to have a baby when I'm trying to do this year. I can't have extremely young kids not sleeping through the night when I'm trying to do this year. But actually I think um, potentially you do need longer than a year just to build a safety net for all the times the study you had planned will um, fall through. So I think maybe thinking about 18 months is potentially a more realistic goal um, when I didn't get through um, the March sitting, I had about, um, it was about, by the time I found out, it was about 16 weeks until the next sitting. So I just rewrote, rewrote this, I called it my 16 bonus weeks of revision and sort of wrote a new revision timetable. Um, and for me, it felt, even though I was exhausted, it felt the right thing to do to just keep going and just sort of try to keep the knowledge trajectory increasing rather than I was just worried if I stopped, I would just, I just wouldn't pick it up again. So I think, I would, you know, if you're really close, um, maybe thinking about if you can just find a little bit more fuel in the tank and just try and try and get it over with, you know, just so it, because I never stopped studying, the kids never um, realised, you know, and they were sort of not happy about it, but we, you know, we got used to it by then, I suppose. Yeah. We were able to just keep going. And now that it's all over, it's yeah, it's obviously so much better. <laughs> I think that sounds like really good advice. I mean, I certainly took a year of studying with no children yeah. uh, and, and I know I'm not alone in that. So and also recognising, as you say, that anything with children, is, as, as you pointed out, does take so much longer. Um, I, it doesn't surprise me that you would recommend 18 months. Yeah. That being said, there's a, there's a big push. Uh, a, a lot of registrars find there's a big push to sit in their first year, yeah. um, it, which is, of course, less than 18 months after they, the registrars find out they've even got a position on the training program. So what advice would you give to people that find themselves in that position where they've just found out they've got a, a position but they've got young children at home and they're trying to plan when to sit their exams? Yeah, so I think the absolute um, first thing you need to do is try to get your kids sleeping as well as you possibly can because <laughs> you need them to sleep so you can sleep, so you can study. That was like the number one thing that had to be sorted out first. Um, and then thinking about, you know, if you could study if you are pregnant or not. Um, and then I think it's important to be really conscious that your training time does add up. So for me, 
um, working part time and studying while on maternity leave was a way to like game the system, if that makes sense, because my um, my my hours would just stop and I could keep studying, but my um, training time just stopped. So it actually took me it took me two and a half years to do first year, which, which sounds, you know, I'll probably win the award for the longest person <laughs> um, with working part time. You know, I, I worked part time for a year. I worked full time for six months and I had a year of maternity leave and I studied during that time. So um, that's how I've been managed, managed to study for 18 months and still only, you know, um, still work within the BT2 time. But obviously, and there's and there's extended basic training as well which I think is an additional year with no, um, which you can just tick over into with no sort of complication, which you can take advantage of too. Yeah. Well, that's, um, that's a lot to think about. Thank you very much, Steph, for sharing right. all of that with us. And I'm sorry for throwing in a few questions that you were not expecting there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Ariane or Ari is also a BTY2 anaesthetic registrar. Uh, she's also a muggle as Steph puts it. Um, <laughs> But not only does Ari not have any medical professionals in her extended family, she's also the only wizard to continue the analogy in her immediate family. Uh, I was going to say that she hasn't had quite the lazy start that the rest of us have had this morning, being based in Western Australia, where it's two hours earlier. <laughs> but I imagine that most of you are parents of small children, in which case the concept of a lazy start is a distant memory. Um, Ari's children are seven-year-old Malia and five-year-old Willow, who are cared for by Steph's mother-in-law during work hours and for her husband and by, and by her husband uh, for most after-school care and bedtimes. Some of her other big loves are earrings, camping, and pole driving. So Ari, okay. thanks so much for joining us today. Um, um, thanks for having us. You're welcome. What what lessons did you learn from your first sitting, and how did this change your approach to your subsequent successful sitting? Yeah, so I, um, like Steph has mentioned, um, you know, quite a few points, but I want to reiterate them again, um, because I think that they are actually really big for um, mums. And um, I suppose I sat my first sitting at the beginning of BT2 um, in March. Um, and I suppose from that, I felt I wasn't ready, but um, I felt the pressure to sit. Um, and so I learned, I learned a little bit about the exam structure and especially the viva. So I think that that was really helpful for the first part, um, uh, even though I didn't get through. Um, in terms of the viva, you know, we have to travel again um, and I hate being away from my family. I'm such a sook, like the biggest sook. So that was good, you know, to just sort of be able to figure that sort of social component out as well and let's be honest when you have to travel you have to set up your whole household also for that whole week so um you know that's a big challenge and I got that better sorted quicker the second time around as well um and I suppose um just in between just you know seeing how I can better practice the SAQs and fibers I suppose because I've now sat them once um, I think the other aspect was for myself um, and learning from myself and learning to trust how I felt as a mum and a person. Um, because like I mentioned, um, I mean, I, I did this all working full-time, studying full-time, mumming full-time. Um, and I wish I had had people mention or support or um, encourage me to maybe do it part-time um, a part-time work like Steph has mentioned just to give me that that room to um, to move so that was if I didn't get through this last sitting that is definitely what I would have done. Um, Did you but, feel any pressure to work full-time or was that a, a, a personal choice? Um, it was a personal choice but I suppose I didn't really because nobody else was doing it um, particularly in WA there's only a very few handful I mean Julia and I um, um, mums I think there's like a couple of others the rest are um, either partnered single or dad so nobody else was sort of doing that so it wasn't I think the pressure actually came more the unspoken pressure to yeah. sit in the first sitting with the rest of the cohort that you started with which is that sort of 12 month period um, and sort of from the rotational program in 
WA, I mean, I, I love them. They're, it's nothing against them. I think that there just needs to be maybe a shift in how that works because we're, they're a, they say they support you for three sittings of the exam, which they it sort of assumed that it would be BT um, early BT2, uh, late BT2, and then first sitting BT extended if, it, you know, that kind of rolls out. And I, I'm sure that, like, if you speak to people, that that could potentially be rolled in, in or, or manoeuvred in certain ways to get you through. Um, but, you know, multiple people have had to come off the program and then find independent work to facilitate them passing the exam. So, you know, there's this unspoken pressure that you feel to sit in a certain time period. And I suppose I learned from myself that I have to choose like if this happens again for me where I know I was definitely not ready to sit the exam for the final exam, I will ha not hesitate in reassessing, deferring. And I'm not saying like, oh, I'm just nervous to sit. I'm like, I knew I was not ready. I just mm -hmm. covered the curriculum. I hadn't had time to revise. So I think that's the biggest thing was actually a personal learning from me rather than how I structure things to get through the exam. It's um it's interesting that the training scheme has a different number of maximum sittings essentially that are able to be granted compared to what the college requirements are. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think the WA is necessarily alone in in that. So it's um mm. that that's a sort of an additional challenge that you need to uh, consider as a registrar, isn't it? It's your rotation yeah. requirements, not just your the national college requirements. Yeah, exactly. Because especially in WA, if we don't if we have to go independent because we don't pass in the rotational program, we actually have to move states to be able to get some of our specialty subunits because we only have, um, you know, certain hospitals that do like neurosurgery or cardiothoracics, for example. Um, and then you, you're going to be competing, obviously, with the Eastern State um, uh, trainees as well. But, you know, that's a real consideration. And I'm like, mm. I can't just uproot my entire family. <laughs> no, you know not. for specialty subunits you know mm -hmm. mm. so if you could give advice to other mums planning on seeing the primary exam with small children what would it be um I think sit when you're ready um and like I mentioned don't don't delay it just because you're nervous or you know oh maybe I don't but sit when you're ready like I really had this deep sense that no I am not ready I have only just covered the curriculum I haven't really rev revised as I know I need to um and like that actually had that had I had a lot of self-doubt in my first sitting somehow I managed to get a viva and I kind of wish I didn't because I would have actually then had you know more study time for this yeah. my next my next go so I felt like I was on the back foot the entire time um, and thankfully, I don't have to do it again, but just sit when you're ready and I think that's really don't feel that pressure. For, yeah. um, but not just for, for mums, but for anyone to sit when you're ready. Yeah. I think yeah. uh, it is It is a very, there's a lot of depth and breadth required for, of your understanding for this exam. And, and I don't think you ever will feel, like I don't think anyone ever feels like they know everything no. they would know going into the exam. But I think yeah. you do... You do you do hit a, a point where you go, I think I could give it a good red hot crack. Yeah. Um yeah. and most people that I've spoken to that have sat more than once reached that point on their subs on their successful sittings, but didn't reach that point on their initial settings, the sittings. Yeah. Uh, but I suppose yeah. one of one of those things that with hindsight is much easier to recognize than at the at the time. Yeah. And I think also just to say, like, I think 18 months is for a mum who um it, 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 things just take longer. I think 18 months is actually really a far more realistic time period for us to sit our first sitting um, without that pressure. And I think that also um, I had a lot of people say to me, oh, wow, I can't imagine you you doing this as a mum. It was hard enough, not a mum, but nobody actually has, you know, real solutions to that. Mm -hmm. And then to follow that, they're like, oh, you know, just, just sit it because you know, what's the worst that can happen? It's, you know, financially, but actually the psychological toll that I had, like, I mean, I had anxiety for the first time and had to take beta blockers to get through, you know, the, the exam. Like I've never had an issue with this, you know, 
Um, and so I think just give yourself the time. If you really, truly feel like you're not prepared enough with, you know, obviously not the usual, uh, you know, okay, don't know everything as in deeply as I want to, but like this really deep feeling that you're not ready, just talk to somebody about it. And look, we're getting, you know, people who are really supportive, like Stan, Lahiru, yourself, you know, reach out, talk to people and, and, and delay it if you need to. I think that's all really good advice. And um, what, finally, what positives and negatives do you think comes with having a non-medical partner? And how did this yeah. play in which you approach your exam preparation? Yeah, um, look, I think the biggest pro for me is um, that my hubby is very grounding for me um, and the kids as well. And that there's life outside medicine. <laughs> um, there's, I think, particularly with the primary, obviously I haven't set the final yet, but there's this, everything is the primary. Life is the primary. Um, when you're at work, everybody's, you know, trying to support you getting out of theatre to study as well as, you know, obviously do your clinical time that you need to do. But like life is the primary. Having him be like, well, actually, this is what's happening in the world and in our family and in our life. Mm -hmm. And that actually needs your attention too. And arguably for me, that's actually more important because this is the life I'm living. Um, and the primary exam is this small snippet so just having him ground me was the biggest thing um I think that's really um I think that's really useful so long as they also recognize that it does require a lot of time and effort and and um uh sacrifice on on both yeah. of your parts which it sounds like your husband did recognize well yeah yeah I was just gonna say um I mean it was I it was very difficult for our family unit for this last 18 months like I think it's probably the hardest time that we've been through as a family mm. um because of that that pull um whilst I appreciated being grounded um none of my family and and friends excluding obviously the um and my medical colleagues and, and peers um have ever been through exams they just don't understand like this that. they just yeah. you know most of them haven't even been to university and that there's nothing wrong with that it's just that they don't really understand no. how much this um, this takes. And I suppose, like, you know, that they've always gone, oh, you always say it's hard and you always get through and it's fine. And I'm like, well, yes, but this is different. It's this different. is different. Yeah, exactly. It's, and it, it's an exam yeah. where most people that are sitting it have have never or have rarely failed anything in their life. Yeah. And then this is quite a, it's a, it's a total, totally different ball game, isn't it? It is. And I think that that's important to, to highlight is that um, we, we are, sounds really, oh, I don't, I don't want to sound arrogant or anything, but we are, at, you know, at this level where um, we, we forget that, um, you know, the rest of the world can't really sit these exams and, um, and get through, you know, many people obviously can, but like, um, you forget that and you need just a reality check that actually um, you're normal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Harry. Yeah. There's some really, um, really useful advice there. So thanks very much for sharing your experience. No worries. Congratulations to Ari and to Steph uh, for, for passing the exam despite having little people at home. <laughs> um, thank you all for opening up to us so honestly and sharing your experiences. Um, I will finish with some advice from the friend I spoke of earlier who sat both exams with small children. Um, she was awarded the Cecil Gray Prize for her performance in the final exam. She's, she's given me a number of uh, points of advice uh, sitting as a mother. So one, allocate time to study, get away from family, for example, to the library, but then allocate time to be with them and not study. Uh, two, use time wisely, for example, at um, studying at work, listening to podcasts while driving and walking the pram. Three, it's a short period. Give it everything so you can get it done. Four, where possible, rely on a supportive family and crew. Five, let your standards drop so low. No sheet changing, no cleaning, reheated food. <laughs> Six, outsource if you can afford it, even if it means going into debt to get the exams done, you'll earn money later. And seven, and lastly, efficiency. Set small goals, for example, one SAQ. Break it down so you feel like you're achieving. I thought it was um, uh, good to get some final advice from her as well.
So I'd like to take this opportunity as well to recommend that you all consider joining the ASA if Lahiru and Stan don't mind me putting out a, a quick plug. <laughs> um, the ASA offers several educational opportunities to its registrars, including boot camps for the, both the primary and final exams, regular written and viva preparation sessions for both exams and complementary registrations to one ASA and National Scientific Congress for its registrar members, um, and membership for basic trainees is currently complementary. Um, they also support and represent their members in situations such as some of the ones that you've heard about this morning. Uh, so I just thought I would take the opportunity to, um, to mention that. Um, I'll now hand back over to Lahiru for a Q&A panel uh, with Steph, Ari and Julia. Could I, could I just say something super quickly? Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, I just want to reiterate um, what Julia was saying about the study groups um, because I was, you know, a part of that um, and um, like the last one and I did sort of study groups two ways. Like with the first sitting, it was more of a like a, a four person. We kind of tried to meet up and that. But as a mum, that really didn't work for me and it took me a long time to figure it out and not feel guilty that I wasn't participating it in the traditional way whereas this last sitting there was about 12 13 of us and um uh, like you could come and go as it needed but we also had like you know things like whatsapp and zoom and so we could ask people questions like what and the support you'd get from a study group um just all the time anytime somebody was always awake and um i just want to say you know maybe think about as a mum in particular, think about study group in a different way. It doesn't have to be the traditional um, sort of, well, all my traditional concepts of what a study group is, because I think both, you know, Julia and I really benefited from the fact that we could come and go um, at the times that suited us. Um, uh, yeah. So I just wanted to reiterate what she said there. I actually think that's a really great point because, um, you know, I, I always thought that a study group was going to be, you know, three to five people max, and that's the only effective way. The fact of what you guys have said with 12 people, I just, I just realized as well, that actually, there's, there's no reason that that can't work. I mean, I remember having probably, you know, my normal study group, but then a couple of other groups of people, again, the same resource, WhatsApp groups, uh, just being able to bounce ideas and meet up with different people at different times is, is just not a problem. It's just having support networks and different people that bounce things off. And and as you say, the WhatsApp group, I think particularly is really useful. I didn't have a study group for um, when I sat either exam, but when I sat the second exam, I had a small WhatsApp group with some other anaesthetic registrars from Queensland. Uh, and we would always just bounce ideas off each other in this WhatsApp group. And you could get to answer or to ask questions whenever suited you. And so when you're busy people, that works out well than trying to get five people to meet all together. They would also meet together in person as well. But the other benefit of that is we've stayed as a, um, that WhatsApp group has continued and we now have this professional support network that means if you're doing a case that you haven't, you haven't considered for a while, you can comment on there or if you've had a difficult day for whatever reason. So there's there's ongoing benefits from it, not just direct the exams as well. I might, <laughs> I might just ask this question for Steph. Uh, what was your experience with study groups? The difference between the study group for the first sitting and having to find a different study group for the se second sitting? So over to you, Steph. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I was exposed to um, two different study groups and um, the... I was a little bit out of sync with everyone when I started studying. So I actually um, found a study group um, online and I would meet with them purely over Zoom. And we just met um, once a week and we'd go through a paper. Um, and this was really helpful. We had a WhatsApp group too, but it just probably wasn't quite the level of intensity that I needed. Um, and then second time around, I was really lucky um, that there was an, a new registrar who came to my hospital who um, was on his first attempt and who was um, one of the most keen people you have ever met. Um, shout out to Dr. Tim Tran, who was a huge source of support uh, for me. And um, he, he had a study group, which he asked me to join. And I think everyone in the study group had never sat before. So they were all extremely keen. They were all also about five years younger than me. So again, all were very keen. Um, they were really happy to work around um, you know, some of the things I needed with the kids, they would schedule things at times which suited me. And um, they, um, uh, you know, they were just, um, they were just great. They also really um, valued me having sat the exam before and would 
like I, 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 I completely agree with what you said, Julie, you sometimes feel like, oh, why would anybody want me? Because I'm obviously not very good at this. But they were like, what was your experience? What was your and they made me realize that um, having not gotten through the exam the first time, I could actually use that to my benefit in that I knew what exactly what the day would look like and how it would run. Um, towards the end, we um, it, it, the group became really, really intense. So we're meeting um, every single weekend. We're meeting online at least twice a week um, at night. Um, you know, we're spending heaps and heaps of time together and like you just get through so much more content um, being in a big group of people and just, you know, going hard for a whole day. I think that's, you know, really made a difference for me. We also did um, a huge number of um, drills uh, in making the most of our um, pre-reading time. So um, with the written exam, you've got you've got 15 minutes. And I think comparing um, the two physical pieces of paper from the two exams, um, for me, you could just see how much more organised I was the second time around. And I wrote this, this massive plan in the first 15 minutes. And then the exam was just, I could just read back over my plan and even just walking in on the day, I was like, all right, we're just, we're just doing a drill. This is just Tim handing out a paper. We're just doing a drill in study group, go. So I, like so much of the fear was gone the second time. And uh, similar to what Ari and Julia have said, I was like, this is my time. I've done the work. I'm passing this exam today. I woke up on the day of the Viva, October 17th. This is the day I passed the primary exam. Let's go. So it was really you know, I think study group helped me get into a much more positive mindset as well. So just took the fear away so you could just perform. That's fantastic. Mm. Just this concept of being lucky enough to be, uh, you know, connected with the right people. I was very lucky. Yeah. And, and it feels almost unfair that sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't, but maybe that's where, you know, we can do make, make a bit of change with this because now the world is smaller with online uh, and just being able to have those groups and maybe even just yeah st start you know th those kind of support groups where you can have everything online and people can just meet up with other people and it could be that easy. Um, question for Ari. Uh, mum guilt is a very common theme, especially with older children. Given you had a relatively older kids, did you ever encounter it? Uh, encounter it, and if so, how did you manage it? Oh, massively. Uh, and I'm such a sook anyway. So um, I, I mean, I've. Throughout medicine, actually, I've, I've felt mum guilt being away from my children. Um, I had a stay-at-home mum until I was 16 years old, and I'm like, am I doing the right thing, having a career? Like, personally, like, you know, for, for myself, not for, you know, not trying to project this on anybody else, obviously. Um, my eldest in particular would, you know, in the last 18 months, particularly the last six months, actually, would be like, mummy, please pass your exam so we can spend time with you. And she, there's nothing malicious about that. But oh my gosh, the mum guilt is just huge. Um, I think the after being unsuccessful the first time, um, what I did to help with that, because obviously I was emo quite emotional about that, um, like just just being unsuccessful anyway um was that I actually um because I'd been scheduling my exact uh, my my study and work and that but actually scheduling family time and not feeling guilty about it I had to choose not to feel guilty about having family time and not studying and I think um Kaylee mentioned it before because I do like I do have that um like if you're studying then you feel guilty because you're not being with your family and if your family you feel guilty because you're not studying um so actually having this is my family time every night I'm doing dinner I'm doing the baths and you know eight o'clock my kids go to bed after that then it's study like that this is my time because and I found that the kids were actually a lot better too because they act whilst loads of people said just a small time the kids won't remember it oh my gosh like that that was not helpful. <laughs> Don't say that to me um, because they actually do feel it and they, they're incredibly clingy when I'm not being around um, and things like that. Like they're emotional beings as well. So I think having that scheduled time helped us both. Something that worked for us, sorry to interject as well, Lahiru, was that um, my husband and I have always, um, he's a couple of years older than me and went through medical school before I did. So we've always done things at different times. So he sat our exam before we had, his exams before we had any children. Um, 
And, you know, I would pick up, picked up a lot of the slack with maternity leave and looking after the kids while he was in his really busy years of advanced training. And so um, this year for him, um, the decision to do an additional year of fellowship, of fellowship at a hospital where he knew everyone and we knew exactly what the year would look like was it helped his career, but also really helped me in that his year was very known to us and he was able to negotiate things and he really um, picked things up and did so much more with the kids. And because he had, um, you know, was often at work previously, they, it was just like this huge novelty thing that like, hey, dad's around and he's doing everything. Um, so that, that kind of worked for us as well. If, if there's people with, you know, two medical partners listening, just uh, staggering all of the, the things that need to be done was helpful for us um, and a conscious decision we kind of made along the way as well. Although, Steph, I hear people talk about that adding additional stress in that you feel there's a significant pressure from the fact that somebody else is then waiting to study after you are, for example, and they're relying on you passing for the timing of their career plans. Yeah, that's really true. That's true. I suppose for us, it, it worked all right because we didn't go through medical school together. So things were always kind of happening at the same time. And then the, the times when physician training is really busy and has exams is a little bit different um, from anaesthetics as well, but that's just our unique circumstance. But yeah, I hear what you're saying. It's similar when people are planning weddings and things straight after their exams and you go, gee, I hope yeah. you pass. <laughs> Hey, so we've got a lot of people in the audience and, you know, I can't imagine that, you know, I can imagine that you'd have many, many questions. Um, is, um, yeah, feel free anyone to jump in to ask questions of any of the, you know, I guess panel members who've spoken. Yeah, feel free now or even in the chat, just um, write anything down and we'll, um, we'll get to it. For those of you that had, actually, I think all three of you had children prior to starting your training, um, if that's right. Did you find that there was, did you feel that this had any impact on your um, application for anesthetic training programs? I think I worried, I worried it would, um, but I, I chose or I worked actually very hard and I spoke to a few mentors as well um, about spinning it in a positive light because obviously um, the training program takes a lot of time and effort and I didn't want them to see that as a negative. I know that like you shouldn't, but that those those um, thoughts and perspectives are still out there. And so I think um, I, I specifically worked particularly on the um, selection criteria. And I think I even brought it in in my panel component. Um, in WA, we have presentation panel and scenarios I don't know or simulation I don't know what the other states do um but yeah I I tried to bring it in and spin it in a positive light I don't think I got any pushback from that component especially because I tried um three times to get on the program the first one was an application um uh, and then the second time I did the application and a uh, uh, I got an interview um and the feedback from that none of that mentioned anything about being overcommitted elsewhere. <laughs> I think there's a lot of anecdotes around town about, you know, various interview panels, you know, may, potentially selecting against it. Um, I know at my hospital, it definitely isn't that. I think we've got a very progressive department um, with, you know, many females in leadership positions who, you know, a lot of our new hires become pregnant, in that, you know, that first year, that's just how, how life is. And, and um you know, obviously it's, 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 I, I just, in, in terms of equity and, and just belief in diversity just improves the culture of a place. I can just, from the experience of where I try, where I work now, it just really feels like that, that it's a great place to work because of, because of that, you know, di diversity and having that flexibility as well. I agree with you, Lihira. I think times, uh, times hopefully in, in most places are changing um, for the better. Uh, you still hear, you still hear, of course, uh, stories that do not support that. I think that the um, the selection process once you get to the interview stage was was very fair in my experience in Queensland and Victoria, um, and I sat the interviews for both states while very pregnant. Um, but I think in the lead up, a lot of people's commentary was incredibly negative. People said you're not going to get on the program with children. If you do get on, you're not going to get through. The program you won't get through the exams if you have children so I think it's really good that the um the panels seem to be you know very fair but I think there's still a lot of negative stigma 
um, out there, uh, particularly from females, I actually found were, was worse. Um, potentially because as a female, maybe you know how much harder it is. But I would always say to people, you know, that people won't get through the training program for so many different reasons. But if you're going to shut people out at the gate because they've got children, you're going to miss out on this diversity in the workforce. Um, and if that's what you want, then fine. But, you know, it would be the program's loss, I would have thought. Steph, so. did you find it hard to uh, essentially buff up your CV in preparation for for your application, given the, uh, the time off to have children, like your, your maternity leave time, et cetera? Yeah, I think it definitely affected my um, uh, first uh, first attempt. Um, yeah, so I didn't I um, didn't get on on my first application to anaesthetics and then got on a year later. And I was just really lucky that um, uh, some in the commentary that was made to me was heard by some of the other consultants who said that that was not appropriate, and then became sort of very supportive in in helping me with the subsequent attempts. So definitely. Uh, getting some people in your corner does help a lot. And then also just like determination and self-belief and just if it's what you really want to do, then you just have to push no matter what anyone's telling you. There's yeah. a great question here in the chat. Um, does anyone have any tips for trying to promote part-time work? It's very variable. People appear to be supportive, but most hospitals still don't offer it, which has definitely gone against me. Um, yeah, a few of our panel members obviously have done that. Um, please, any thoughts? I think like the college does promote that part-time work is available, but it's very much um, hospital dependent and also depends on your um, training scheme. I asked um, both Victoria and Queensland when I was applying what part-time would look like, knowing that or thinking that that was, would be what I would have to do to get through exams. And um, Queensland did seem to be a little bit more um, supportive of it, probably just because I've got a larger pool of registrars. Um, but then it's been my experience that I've still needed to negotiate um, job sharing, you know, for every single year. So it is, I think you just have to ask the question. And, um, but unfortunately, I don't think it's as um, available as the college maybe maybe says it is and there are also other things that you run into with um, part-time training like that um, to be eligible for a reduced um, uh, training fee with ANSCA you actually need a, a one-year part-time training position um, and if you're like half unpaid maternity leave and half part-time that does not count as a one-year training position even though you're earning like a quarter of a normal wage um, so that, I think there's things like that that the college um, could potentially have a look at and make it better. I see there's a question from Stan uh, to me uh, saying, do you think this is an area that ASA can advocate on behalf of a trainee for this? Um, interestingly, I just got off the phone to Vita Villiunas, um, who is very active in the ASA uh, just this morning prior to this, and we're having a, a discussion about this um, sort of thing, actually. And I was saying to her, apart from the educational things that we offer registrars, what, what sort of things uh, can we or should we be doing to, to support and represent registrars? Uh, she actually gave, uh, she actually suggested that if trainees that were ASA members did have issues such as some of the ones that have been discussed them in, um, this morning, if the ASA was approached about this, they would actually go into advocate for the individual trainees. So I think that's really useful to know that. Um, for example, she suggested that in some of the, the meetings that um, were required in terms of when uh, I think Julie was mentioning that she had a meeting with the uh, trainee representatives about uh, suspension rather than expulsion from the, from the program after a third attempt. Uh, Vita suggested this might be a time when an ASA representative might be able to go along to, to assist with that those negotiations. So I think it's really good to know that there is that support available um, for registrars. If, if, and, if and, I like, and I love the idea of actually having, you know, these big organisations which are, you know, do so much good work, almost having like a, a mum officer or some, some kind of officer for disadvantaged or, you know, people with a different pathway just taking off and you know, offloading all the different things that need to be done. I've just listen, written a list of things, but you know, being able to organize flexible training or extension of training time, um, having that 18 months as a potential expectation rather than, than the exception, um, you know, having a different number of max sittings and organizing shifts and part-time.
and even just organizing a study group and getting those things underway. Like these are all things that, you know, are, are definitely doable. And I think it just takes a something to change that really. Um, another question here, yeah, I agree with all that and the fees issue. I've definitely missed out on jobs because I've asked for part-time and I've also been asked at job interviews if I want to work part-time, even though the director outside the interview setting has said that it's unfortunately not possible. It seems to be a funding issue. So obviously these are definitely things to explain. There's so many individual circumstances which make it variable and difficult. But again, there's, it, it, once things become the expectation or once the, the culture changes, then a lot of this will become easier. And I think these are definitely the first steps we need to take to do that. I think maybe over time there will be more people that do require some flexibility in the training program with um, more people being doing postgraduate medicine and then also training programs becoming much more competitive to get onto, which means that you unfortunately do get onto a program quite late. Um, even I feel like the generation above us, you know, have had quite a different experience. Um, and so then maybe more people needing flexible training will mean that there are more positions available because I think the hospitals are, are largely looking to, full, to fill a full-time equivalent. So you sort of need to find someone who's, you know, together you can make up the hours required unfortunately and that again is something that potentially having an online platform can organize these things better but it really is linking people to services and that's it's not a, it's not a difficult thing really whether it's a study group or jobs and what you said about that is actually i feel like you know mums are this you know very very obvious group it's like this really important low level fruit of you know gi giving you know equity and just the you know options and in how you want to do your training and become a, a good doctor and good anesthetist. But also, also, you know, you can, you know, yeah, it's life. You can, you should not, I always thought of myself as I am an anesthetist and it's only since graduating, I go, actually, you know, there's more, more to life than just <laughs> anesthetizing. And, um, you know, to, to, to realize that we're not, we're not all just robots and we're not just all numbers and we have so many important things outside of this. And, you know, it, it, I, I just feel like this is, maybe the, the easiest thing that this conversation is doing to make people everywhere, uh, you know, just very, very aware of that. And that everyone goes through hardships. Everyone needs options and everyone have, might have priorities outside. Mom, dad, uh, maybe you've got chronic disease. Maybe there's some, yeah, that whole, you know, if you really could put yourself in someone else's shoes, I mean, yeah, that, that is that level of empathy that I think we all need. And I think conversations like the ones we're having today is starting off that, that openness and that discussion that you've um, that that you're talking about, Julia. The fact that you three have so honestly shared your your experiences has has been really helpful. So thank you. Yeah, look, I just want to say, you know, thank you so much to Steph, Ari, Julia, Kaylee. Just some incredible stories, incredibly inspirational. And as I told uh, Kaylee last night, motivation is the best caffeine. It absolutely is. And you honestly find it through inspirational stories such as yours. And that's why, you know, it's so important for you to be heard. I think ideas need to evolve in the way we, you know, we deliver edu education, the way we support our trainees. And this is just the start. So I'm really excited to see where this uh, goes to. And, you know, you guys will be the leaders of this field in the next couple of years. So I'm really excited to see where you guys are going to take this. Um, and I'm, really happy to know that you know you are in our specialty and i know that uh we'll, we'll be in good hands so thank you so much and thanks lahira and stan for for starting these you know, for having these conversations starting them so i love the conversation i think we're all people here of action so this is not just going to be a conversation we've definitely got things that we can get done and you know this will be the start that we try, try to back you guys and back everyone for the future because you know the kind of world that we create now is for our, you know it's for our children for everyone and after us as well so i might um close there thank you so much everyone for your time this is your coffee break um please share with anyone who might be interested because it will be you know obviously very relevant to so many people not just mums and um, yeah we'll see you again next time thanks everyone